I'm sorry. I got held up. I should have had this ready. I was been behind. It's okay. I mean, we'll, we can get by without it. At least you can see us. So, you know, you can still be a part of the conversation. You can see what's happening. I can't see him flip me off though. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I've been doing the whole time. While this podcast will always be free, the time and effort that goes into the production isn't. Show your support and join our Patreon community today. To this day, the Eagle Rare Life Award has awarded more than $500,000 to rare individuals and charities they support. Read the stories from this year's nominees and vote at eaglerarelife.com. Hurry, because voting ends on December 5th, 2018. If you're looking for a new glass that complements any drinking experience, whether it's neat, on the rocks, or with a cocktail, look no further than the Duo Glass from Aged and Ore. Use code PURSUIT to get 15% off your order and free shipping at agedandore.com. That's agedandore.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to this week's episode. And the start of this one sounds a little bit off because last week was the announcement of the death of Master Distiller... Dave Pickerel, who had been behind a lot of brands such as Whistle Pig, Hill Rock, Corsair, and many others. You know, for myself, looking back at this, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of interaction with him, but I did get the opportunity to share the stage with him at Bourbon and Beyond in 2018, where we got to sit there on stage together, literally right next to each other, and talk about stories of the Russells. So, it, it wasn't an interesting time to be actually able to have that face-to-face communication. I remember actually going to Bourbon and Beyond, uh, seeing him right away, knowing his face because we had done a podcast with him and and being able to shake his hand and you know he knew I was right away too. So it was a really cool experience to be able to do that uh, and share that moment with him. And for anybody else that just didn't know Dave, um, if you want to just know more about him, what he meant to the industry, what he did, what was his life story... We did have a podcast with him. It was back on episode 142, and we titled it The Man Behind 100 Distilleries. Uh, And it probably would have gone even higher than that if he would have stuck around a little bit longer. So prayers go out to his family and friends uh, during this time. Now, another thing uh, that sort of happened and launched this week was a friend of mine named Will Chambers. He just launched a new podcast. So if you're looking for something else to go and listen to. It's called The Lounge with Will Chambers. He's a former ESPN Dallas reporter, and he's an old college friend of mine, as I'd mentioned. And after the recording, you know, we, we, he had me on to kind of talk about uh, whiskey and brown water, but his is really focused around things such as sports and culture and all this sort of stuff. So it's going to have a, a mix of a lot of different things. And just from a personal expression, you know, after the recording, I couldn't believe how amazing he was in front of a microphone. So if you want to get your weekly dose of all these things, including like dating device and just a myriad of topics, I invite you to go and check it out. It's called The Lounge with Will Chambers. It can be found on iTunes as well as any of those other audio-only podcast syndicates. And I will have a link in the show notes as well. This past week, Ryan and I were traveling down to Tennessee to actually pick our next barrels of Pursuit Series releases. So we chose a few different barrels. We're very excited to be able to bring these to you. And we've got uh, the next releases kind of going out here for the next uh, few months. So look forward to that. Check it out, PursuitSpirits.com to see the Cecil Coleman Pursuit Series releases. And you can see how you can get your hands and access on those bottles as well. Now, for the topic of this show, I don't know a bourbon enthusiast that doesn't love Four Roses. It's just one of those things that, that that people always gravitate towards. It it goes well with chocolate. It goes well with cigars. It goes well with a lot of different kind of pairings. But this episode goes into some of those random thoughts that we all have. They could be misconceptions behind the mash bills. Um, what's the hype behind certain runs that you hear about people coming out with? Like, oh, this certain recipe in this warehouse had really great time in here or maybe the hype behind some single barrels because they've got some stickers on them but one of our guests today was recently talking about private picks and holds a lot true for this topic as well and our other guest today 
was known as one of the biggest Four Roses fans of all time. So I want to say, first off, thank you to everybody that is subscribing. If you haven't yet, go and check it out. You know, like I said, you're listening to these on audio. You can check it out on Stitcher, Spotify, um, you know, iTunes. And if you're more of a video person, you want to see what the interaction looks like between all of us as we are talking, check us out on video too. You can subscribe to us on YouTube as well as Facebook. Now with that, enjoy this week's episode. And here's a quick message from Joe at Barrel Bourbon. And then we get to hear Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hi, this is Joe Beatrice from Barrel Bourbon. Batch 16 was a project that took over a year. We selected 9 to 15 year old barrels with similar profiles from different distilleries. It's deeply concentrated, but not too oaky, and finishes with a toasted orange note. You can find it on the shelves at your nearest retail store. Hi, I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Dave Pickerel. The man was bigger than life and large in posture. He'd walk into a room to promote Whistlepig, wearing an all-white suit, almost busting at the seams, fully earning his nickname in Whistlepig's limited edition moniker, Boss Hog. He single-handedly legitimized craft whiskey. In addition to being Whistlepig's and Hill Rock's master distiller, Pickerel, who, by the way, was the 14-year-long master distiller for Maker's Mark, consulted for more than 100 distilleries. He did so at discount for many, even free for some, and almost always on a handshake. He didn't do contracts. When Pickerel passed away last week, I thought of our many moments together, from sharing drinks at various conferences on, to our backstage Metallica photo shoot, where I interviewed James Hetfield and Lars Ulrich. Dave and I became friends. I mean, real friends. Once, I was struggling to grow my beard, and I asked his advice for how to trim it. The West Point graduate, who has a very similar beard to mine, seemingly knew everything about everything. He gave me a tutorial on how to grow it better and to make it look more fuller than it really was. Professionally, when I had a funky distillation question, I called Dave. Less than a week before his death, Dave and I had this text exchange. Me. What are the flavors you get out of distilling buckwheat? Dave. Ugh, yuck. Seriously, buckwheat is very aggressive. It's a very aggressive grain. It pretty much needs to be distilled as light whiskey to be palatable at all. That was our final conversation in this life. Dave lived an interesting life, mostly out of a suitcase and in random hotel rooms, traveling from one distillery to another. In the whiskey geek world, he often caught flack for consulting for so many distilleries. Some suggested he'd do anything for a buck and ridiculed his high prices on Whistlepig. Little did he know, he often didn't charge upstart distilleries and deliberately issued $500 price tags to avoid his whiskey making it on the secondary market. He once told me he loathed the secondary market so much that he would price above it all the time. Dave was certainly opinionated. But love him or hate him, I cannot think of another distiller in American whiskey who influenced more brands than Dave Pickerel. He was a legend, and I will miss him. And that's this week's Above the Char. Make sure you subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine to read the feature I wrote about Dave Pickerel and his connection to Metallica. You can subscribe at bourbonplus.com. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny here with this episode. We're going to be doing something that is, it's pretty, it's pretty normal to kind of, you know, go up and down the, the aisles at your local liquor store or be able to uh, find a, a, a single barrel Four Roses recipe uh, pretty much anywhere in the nation now. You know, the, the idea of having... A, a store pick of a single barrel of four roses is nothing new that anybody that's into bourbon is, is accustomed to. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we have to ask ourselves. Um, is there a reason that we always maybe gravitate towards one particular recipe? Is it there, is there a store that always consistently has better picks or private picks than anyone else? And we're going to sit there, we're going to try to examine what we think each one of these really, you know, all kind of means we might touch on a little bit of the individual 10 recipes and, you know, maybe, maybe some, uh, some of the flavor notes 
now that I just said that, you know, I, I think I forgot to run downstairs and actually go get one of my little pamphlets that always come on those, those four rows of single rail picks. So I can remember them all and see what I'm looking at. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll make it through this. So tonight, uh, we've got two gentlemen that are joining us on the show. Uh, one is familiar. The other is somebody else's brand new. So I'll let somebody that's been on the show before go ahead and go first. So Brett, go ahead and take it away. Introduce yourself. Uh, Brett Atlas, um, a contributor at uh, Bourbon Banter, uh, bourbonbanter.com. Uh, you can find me at Twitter, uh, Brett At at Brett Atlas, or Instagram at Brett Atlas, and I'm thrilled to be here uh, to talk about Four Roses with Travis, who knows as much as anybody. And that was that was the segue that. that was yeah that was the, kind of the, the segue that we really needed because there's. There is one person that is sort of known on the Facebook forums as the guy that, uh, I mean, he might as well be the, the a protege of, of, you know, Jim Rutledge and all these other people just because he, he's got a wealth of knowledge when it just comes to Four Roses stuff. So, uh, Travis, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my name's Travis Hill. Um, not anyone special, honestly, just a guy who likes to drink bourbon and specifically Four Roses. Uh, it's really what got me into bourbon, and um, every time I go there, I have a great time. Done a ton of barrel picks, and it's probably half of my bar and you know half of my stash. So um, I just think for the price, especially, I mean, the quality, you know, single barrel cash strength. I think the the everything about it is just great. So it's what I gravitate towards. I love to learn about it, and uh, know a lot of these guys, you know, all like it as well. So it's something that we uh, comes up in conversation quite often, and. I just like to learn about it and, and share the information. So uh, I don't have any um, social media, you know, except for Facebook. But anytime you're in the Louisville, just uh, give me a shout. We'll grab a drink. Yeah, I'm sure you've got plenty of the recipes on your bar, too. But I, I think, Travis, I think one good question to ask you is sort of, you know, was it the cash drink single barrel thing that got you into Four Roses? Or what was that initial, uh, I guess, attraction to it that kind of kept you there and kind of what's kept you hooked? Yeah, so the first thing I ever had was the 100 proof standard single barrel. Uh, and I tried that when I first got into bourbon. It was, you know, Elijah Craig. Um, you just kind of went down the line. And the first time I bought one of those Four Roses, I just loved the flavor. I thought uh, I didn't really know much about bourbon at the time. I just thought it drank great. I thought the proof was really cool, just full of flavor. So I went through about five or six bottles of that and um, just through Instagram found a store pick, you know, and I had no clue what I was getting into. Uh, so that was a whole adventure for years. I mean, trying hundreds of barrels, trying to figure out what you like, you know, you think you like one recipe, you try another barrel of that same recipe and you don't like it. I mean, I hated cues forever until this last year and there's been some incredible OESQ and I, I love it. So, um, definitely the variety keeps you in it, you know, all 10 recipes, like I said, each recipe can be different from each barrel to barrel so i mean it's always a new adventure you find new stuff new recipes you know kind of show themselves in different ways so i mean it's never ending man i always am surprised at what i come across well i think uh you mentioned a, a good part right there talking about the the recipes because we want to definitely uh touch on those but brett i want to ask you too what is there something about four roses that initially attracted you i think that um re really they do a couple things very very well i think that um, even going back, they, the, the, the single barrels are terrific. And I don't know anywhere else where you have that kind of variety that you, that you have 10 different recipes and how they can vary so much from bottle to bottle and barrel to barrel. And, and, um, it, it just gives you a, such a great value. I, I don't know of many that are, that, that price people out of the market. Uh, there's, there's so many of them now, granted, some of them, uh, recently are a little bit younger, but I think as Travis will probably touch on, uh, in a lot of cases, that's even better depending on, um, you know, how they were aged and, and, and what, and what recipe they are. There's some terrific younger ones and, and I just think they have a great thing going. And I also think they're limited editions. I mean, I've been, I've been critical of a couple of them, but I mean, when you scrape that aside, I mean, who's doing better limited edition blends and, and, you know, they'd be one or two a year and, and there's a decent amount of them out there. I, I just think they're, they're doing some great things and, and there aren't many brands out there that solid. 
So, uh, Travis, I want to ask you just so we can kind of give a, a, a baseline for everybody. How do you how do you know the the recipe? So when you see like O and then the letter and then, you know, S and then the letter, like what what does it mean? I mean, I know we all know what it means, but I just help explain it uh, for those people out there that are maybe just now starting to get into single roses or sorry, single barrel roses and, and how they differentiate between, you know, OBSK versus OESQ and stuff like that. Right. So it's a four letter, you know, acronym or combo, whatever you want to call it. The O is always the same and the S is always the same. You have the second letter will either be an E or a B. Um, the E is um, low rye in the mash bill, which is 20%. It's actually still pretty high for the industry. Uh, and then the B would be 35%. So, I mean, a lot of times you get some of these recipes, they taste like rye whiskey almost. And that's another cool thing. Um, so that's a high rye content. Um, and then you have but, the, uh, like a high rye and a higher rye. High rye and a higher rye. Exactly. <laughs> higher rye. That's exactly yeah. it. <laughs> Um, and then you have the five yeast, um, you know, there's V, K, O, Q, and F. Um, and they all impart kind of different flavors, and they're not always the same, but they generally kind of uh, stick to similar flavors. The V is, you know, tends to be kind of sweet and creamy and fruity. Uh, the K is real spicy, kind of like baking spices, chocolate. The O is kind of berry flavored. Q is floral. F, you get like some tobacco kind of mint. Um, can be sweet too. F is really good when it's really sweet. Um, so, so that's kind of just a quick breakdown. No, that's that's good because for anybody that that go out, I got actually got kind of lucky. I was sitting here and I was scrambling. You might have been hearing while Travis was talking. I was actually able to pull the neck tag off of one of the bottles I have next to me. So I'm actually able to uh, talk intelligently when I'm talking about the recipes now. But <laughs> one, of the, one of the questions that I did want to run by you, because I personally haven't tried all 10 recipes before. You know, when you, when you look at the back of that neck tag uh, and somebody's walking down the aisle and they get the opportunity and, and they see it and they say like, oh, OESV is delicate, fruity, fresh and creamy, where OESK is spicy and full body. Um, do you think there's any one of these that have the tasting notes on the back that aren't necessarily accurate? Or do you think what they put on there is is pretty much on point? Yeah, I think they're they're pretty much on point. I mean, those are kind of like the overarching flavors that you would get. Um, and then each single barrel has, you know, different manifestations of those flavors and then kind of unique flavors. But yeah, I think they're pretty spot on. I mean, they've always been really good about their tasting notes. And Brett, how many times have you had a, a full lineup tasting of all 10 recipes side by side? Uh, not at once. I've done, um, I wrote a review a long time ago um, where I did all of the B's. Um, and then I've been kind of, the reason why I didn't go back to do the E's is because I learned too much and I went back and cringed at my first review. So um, <laughs> I, I, le I learned a lot about try you, you there's a lot of reviews out there and I give people a lot of credit for for going through the whole lineup. First of all, tasting 10 of anything at once is you're not you're never going to be you're never going to get it. Um and also I what whatever going through 10 single barrel picks, you may as well do that 20 different times because you're going to uh -huh. winner every time. Right. So there's right. nothing and then that's throw in doing different barrels yeah. too, you know. <laughs> It's infinite. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's just it. You, you're not going to pigeonhole these things. It's, there's an infinite combination out there and, and it's going to be an adventure for your life to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there was actually a question in the chat that uh, Jerry and Kendrick had put out to everybody else in there. It said, so what's your, what's your favorite recipe? Um, you know, some people are saying OESK, some are saying OESQ, OESO. What about you guys? Do you guys have a favorite recipe and why? Uh, Brett, I'll let you go first. I have died here, Travis's answer. I, um, I did um, early on. I had the Q. The first one I fell in love with was a. It was an eleven-year OBSQ. It was the greatest thing I've ever had. I think uh, I only have one or two bottles left, but it, it's still my favorite one I've ever had. Um, I, I can't say it's my favorite though because I've had. I've also had bad Qs. Um, I had two of them, and then I had another good one. So. Um, Lately, I will tell you lately, I'm really into the F a lot. 
um, primarily because I had my first F was one I didn't like. So I dismissed it like a fool and I never went back to it. I missed a lot of good battles of F I just passed on that were offered to me. Um, but I'm getting back into that now. So my favorite now um, is probably probably F because how different it can be. Um, it's not the most consistent, but I think when they're on, they're really good. What about you, Travis? Yeah, I mean, I, F isn't my favorite, but um, it's OESF definitely can be in my top five. Like Brett just said, when it's good, it's tough to beat. Um, I always go back to OBSK. I think that's just my favorite. It's so different. The, you know, it's just big, bold, spicy. You got to, I love like the cinnamon, chocolate, um, just just big, massive flavors. So that's my favorite. You know, I, I, I'm happy to drink, you know, eight or nine of them. So there's only a couple I really don't <laughs> care for. And, and even then, I've had great barrels of those recipes I don't like. It's just very few and far between. Right. So I, I guess I, what about you, Kenny? well, okay. For me, um, I, honestly, it, I think it's tough for me to provide an answer because I haven't tried so many next to each because I, I, I could grab one. I could be like, yeah, that's great. I could grab this one. Yeah, it's great. But I don't sit there and try like, you know, three OESKs next to each other to say like, ah, yeah, this is, this is, this is my jam right here. I honestly don't know what I lean towards. Um, maybe I, maybe I fall too much into the hype factor where, you know, if it's got a cool sticker on the side, I'll be like, yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be a sweet four roses pick. Um, <laughs> maybe that's what it is. I don't really know. There's been a few things that I said in the chat. Like, has, has anybody really had a bad one? I personally never have, uh, Brett said he has, what about you, Travis? Have you ever had a bad four roses pick? Yeah. Um, but I could probably count them on one hand. And I mean, as many as I've tried, um, and drinking as many of them as I do, you know, there's there's a ton of them that are just kind of eh, you know, but uh, bad, just a just a few maybe. You're grading mm -hmm. on a curve, though. I mean, and I kind of am too. <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at what Four Roses is able to do and what they put out, to say that, I mean, there's there's been plenty of off-profile Buffalo Traces, plenty of off-profile Wellers that have been out there. Um, same thing with some Russells and stuff like that too. But in regards to Four Roses, nothing seems to veer. I mean, they're all really good, but I've never, like I said, really had one that really veered too far off of that typical Four Roses kind of uh, taste. But I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Yeah. And another thing to point out too is one of the barrels that I don't really like is one that uh, was uh, picked by a group I'm in and – a majority of the people love it. So it's like, okay, it's not my thing, but you guys all love it. That's great. Drink it. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, you know, when you talk about groups, uh, we talk about epic barrel picks out there. We talk about stickers that kind of garnish a little bit of hype on the, on the markets and stuff like that. We've, when you all look at that, I haven't paid too much attention, but when you all look at that, is there a consistent recipe across the board that it seems that these are the categories that they all fall under like one or two different recipes. Uh, I don't, I, I think that some of the, some of the really solid ones are these, but I think because, probably because a really good, like an OBSV, even though it's the standard recipe, a really, really good one is, is good to a lot of people. I think that's one of the reasons why they probably use it as their main single barrel. I think those are, those are exceptional. They're not, they don't get too different. They're not too off profile. Um, but I, I think some of the better ones I've had in the last year or two have been OBSVs, as boring as that may sound. <laughs> well, you, Travis, do you, what, do you have any kind of thoughts or theories that do any of these usually fall into some particular camp? Well, what's cool is that um, over the last couple of years, there's been a real push to uh, get people to taste the barrels blind when they go to pick. Um, and now even four roses is getting involved when you go there now, they turn the barrels around. So you can't even see the recipe. They basically force everybody to taste blind. Um, so I think you, I think you used to see a lot of OESK. Um, that was always a group favorite of the private groups. And I don't know if that was just cause it was awesome, which it was, but I think it was just that kind of that one recipe that everybody, you know, held really high and really liked. Um, 
So that one I used to see a lot, you know, and it kind of, but the, the other thing too, is the way that they have these runs, you know, there's a lot of really good barrels of OESQ right now and OESV. So you don't see as much OESK. In fact, there's, you know, if I've gone the last 10 times, I'd say eight, eight of those times I've gone, the OESK was the worst, like bad, just, it shouldn't be there to pick. So it just kind of changes, you know, as time goes on and, you know, there'll be some OBSK hopefully next year and O's and it just, it's just kind of like cyclical. I would guess I would say. You kind of took the words out of my mouth and, and asking if this was cyclical, because it does seem that if that question that I had posed to you all at the very beginning about, you know, what's your favorite recipe and why I think if we would have put that to 10 people, I think, you know, of, of just, you know, normal everyday kind of bourbon enthusiast, that I bet you probably seven out of 10 would probably say OESK um, right. just because it's just kind of, it's just what's been hot, I think in the past, probably two years. Um, and so, you know, kind of move it over to you, Brett. I mean, have you seen some sort of like cyclical turnover where OESK, OESKs aren't necessarily coming out uh, near as much anymore from uh, private picks or anything like that? You know what's funny about the o, uh, about the OESK and even the OBSK is I like them. They've never really been my favorite, and I don't know, um, I don't know why that is. But but the, the kind of the ironic thing there is is on their own, and I think the Elliott Select I'd put in that category. They're they're good. They they're, they're not great to me. But my favorite limited editions are the ones that are are K heavy. So you know the 2017 and 2015 those were K heavy, and when they're blended. They, they, they put something, they add an element that's just incredible. So I kind of, I like the K and the spice, but I like it mixed with some other, with some other recipe. Um, so, so I'm a bad person to ask about the K's. I don't love them. I've had a couple that I, that I, that I think are good, but, but it wouldn't be my first choice. And, and Travis, to kind of go along with what you were saying, you know, because you've picked plenty of Four Roses barrels before, um, what what do you see as the typical breakdown of the recipes that are that are there uh, for your choice? Like, how many barrels are there? How many different recipes do you usually get to go through? Um, and then I'll, I got probably a few questions to lead on after that, too. Okay. Yeah, I mean, when I first started going, if, you know, was it three years ago or whatever, um, you tasted from all 10, uh, that was just the way it was. And then over the last year and a half, um, it's kind of gotten choppy. Sometimes I've gone and tasted five, six, seven, eight, just depends. Uh, but now the last, you know, nine or 10 times, I feel like it's been seven. They have every recipe except for the O's and OBSK. I think they did like five OBSK last year and maybe six OESOs, no OBSO. So now you, you go and you generally get seven, seven different recipes. I mean, were they, were these, a lot of these barrels getting pushed towards other projects or is it just something where they just said like you had a, we had a good run of OESK for a while. Now we're on this OBSV kick or whatever, whatever you had just mentioned, like where you had mentioned it's sort of cyclical, right? So at this mm -hmm. time, you're going to go through and you're going to get a choice of seven barrels, seven different recipes. Maybe it's actually three recipes. Like, I don't really know, right? Mm -hmm. um, is, is there is there a turnover rate where you could expect to, um, you know, not ever get a chance to try uh, more than, say, five recipes? Or is it every time you actually get to try seven different recipes? Yeah, I think what they try to do is have – for every barrel they have, it's a unique recipe. So like I said, the last, you know, handful of times I've gone, there's seven barrels, seven recipes. That's been fairly consistent. So, I mean, they're not going to give you six barrels and half of them are OBSV. I mean, you're always going to get different recipes. You may have eight barrels and, you know, maybe two are the same recipe, but they generally try to give you one barrel of each recipe. Um, and the reason they don't have the O's and the OBSK is um, because the you know the the bourbon market has exploded. So they're uh, the O's and the K's make up the small batch. They're in the yellow label. Um, so those are their you know most used recipes. Um, and they maybe just didn't make enough you know seven or eight years ago. So we'll see it all again soon. Um, 
but right now they just don't have those three. Right. I mean, Travis, Travis hit on something. I think that a lot of people may not realize that the fact that they roll out seven barrels for you is not common when you go taste barrels in Kentucky. So right. I mean, when you go, when you go to beam or you go to Buffalo trace, you're not getting seven barrels. So that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is an anomaly that they do that. And, you know, Brett, it sounds like you've done this uh, a time or two as well. So when, when you guys usually go and you, you choose these barrels, is there some recipe that usually comes up as a clear favorite um, every single time? Or has it been pretty random every time that there's just happens to be a different one that stands out depending on that day? I, I think it just depends on, on, on what, and what people think that are there, the, the group you're with. I, you know, the, the, the recipe is one, is one thing, but there's, there's the barrel makeup. There's the there's the age of it. There's the location. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Like tra- and as Travis said earlier, and I've noticed this too, you know, the just because the F is supposed to be herbal, it doesn't mean it's not going to come out fruity. And there's just a lot of factors there that can change change one recipe into something completely different. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't think you. I, I think you make a mistake when you go in w- with your mind. Like some people go in saying, "God, I hope we get a really good F." Or God, I hope we we really get a, a solid Q this time. I mean, you can't do that. You 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 every. <laughs> I mean, you get you can get some really special barrels out of nowhere, and you, and and that's what you're going for. You're not yep. you're not really you're not going you're not you you shouldn't be going with something in mind. I think what's really cool about uh, about Four Roses also is you know when you have o, when you have O W A or you have Elijah Craig, you know what the profile is. You know what the standard release is. I think with Four Roses. I mean, you know what the OBSV is if you drink the single barrel off the shelf, but you got 10 different recipes. And unless you're Travis or somebody who has done this just dozens and dozens of times, I mean, uh, what's a profile to one person is not to another. So um, you're definitely going to get different experiences based on who you're with. Right. Uh, yeah. Jerry asked as well, have you ever left Four Roses without ever picking a barrel? Because Travis, I know you've done this a time or two. So is, is there ever been one time that was just an anomaly? This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Every year, there are hundreds of stories, just like the ones you're going to hear, that are in the running for the Eagle Rare Life Award. Sean Swarner, he's a man that survived two terminal cancer prognosises, climbed Mount Everest with one lung, climbed the highest mountains in each continent, and skied to the North and South Poles. Or Tiffany Fixter. She's a former special education teacher who founded the first brewery to hire adults with developmental disabilities. The grand prize of $50,000 will go towards the charity or cause of the winner's choice. Voting ends December 5th, so head over to eaglerarelife.com and vote now. Versatility. It's what's been missing in the glass space. We've got rocks, Glencairns, Copitas, Brandy Snifters, and more to accommodate a wide range of drinks, and the way we enjoy it, with or without ice. It took a Kickstarter campaign to change things up, and this is where the duo glass from Aged and Ore comes in. It's a 10-ounce double wall glass that eliminates the need for coasters. It's tulip-shaped that allows your sense of smell to pick up a wide array of flavors. And it has one-ounce indicators, so no need for more glassware when making cocktails or pouring just the right amount of your favorite bourbon. It's also ice ball ready that comes with its own two inch ice mold that snugly fits into the glass for a slow melting experience. For a limited time, Bourbon Pursuit listeners get 15% off orders and standard free shipping at agentore.com using the code PURSUIT. So go over to agentore.com, that's aged and O-R-E.com and get your duo glasses today. Have you ever left Four Roses without ever picking a barrel? Because Travis, I know you've done this a time or two. So, is is there ever been one time that was just an anomaly? Um, no, actually. And uh, so, to hit on two points, um, I did Captain's Three uh, last year, and two things about that: I I I wanted a barrel, but I had gone a couple times and wasn't, you know, impressed with what they had. And I was like, man, if I'm buying a whole barrel, I want to get something really good. Uh, so I was ready to walk away at that point, but I've never walked away and I don't know of anybody else that has, um, they usually come up with something for you. 
but the funny thing about that pick was I specifically told myself I do not want a Q. That was the one thing I didn't want. I do not want any Q. Lo and behold, we picked a tier six OESQ that's just incredible, you know, 124 proof. And just, it just blew me away. It was clearly the best. There was five of us. We all liked it. I mean, it was just, and it's just like, well, I'm, I'm buying a Q because it's awesome. <laughs> so, well, okay. So explain that. Like, why, why would you go into the mentality of saying you, you didn't want that? Is just because you've done it plenty of times before, or what was the, what was the mentality? The Q? Yeah. Well, like, why you didn't want the Q? I just never really liked it. I mean, I've uh, just had it a bunch of times and it never really hit me right. Um, it's it's the yeast that imparts the least amount of flavor to the bourbon. So it's really all about the barrel with the cues. Um, and I just never, I don't know. I just was always stuck on the V's, O's and just kind of didn't really appreciate the cues. And, and, a, and a lot of times the cues aren't really good. You know, the employees will tell you, but when they're, when they're kind of like, off profile they're awesome um so i just i just if i was going to do it i was like i want an o or a v or a k or something like that and you know ended up with a q so let's let's kind of switch gears a little bit and we'll talk about maybe like some misconceptions that are in the market so brett what do you think is like a, a misconception of when people when they they either they look at the um, the barrel pick process or they look at the barrel picks themselves or they're going down the aisles and they're trying to figure out because when you go to say like liquor barn or even total wine or even those massive ones they're going to have like seven or eight picks of different ones on the shelves of different recipes so what's a what's like a misnomer that could lead people to choosing something that they they typically wouldn't you know like well, how would you guide them in the right direction well at first i want to know how the pick was done. I think when you're, if you don't know what happened, I, there's two things that at least in our state here, there, if they send you samples to a store, you, you have two choices. You either are going to get the hundred proof uh, and you can pick the three samples that they send you, which in, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but my assumption is that when, by the time those samples get to a store here, that they've been picked through by every barrel picking group and everyone else. And, you know, I don't know how many stores have been offered and rejected those, but you're get you, you're gonna pick you get your pick of three, but you don't know what three. So when I see a hundred proof store pick, I get concerned. And the other the other option though, which is equally scary to me, is if if you don't go do the pick down there, they'll give you a barrel proof, but you don't you don't get to pick it. So you let you let I I, I don't know it's Brent Elliott sometimes. Sometimes they say pick by the master distiller. Maybe it isn't Brent Elliott. I don't know who's picking it. But I've had picks that were selected by Brent Elliott that I didn't love. And I would feel a lot better if I knew that the person at the store told me, yeah, you know, I went there. This is what we did. This is how I picked it. That's how I would. So at a bare minimum, how I would guide somebody is I would grab the manager and I'd say, can you tell me how this pick was done? That, that would be my starting point. Yeah. And, and Travis, I think you and Brett are pen pals right now. So <laughs> have you ever like when you when you try stuff that says selected by Brett Elliott or you know it's something that's just at the Four Roses gift shop? Um, you know what's your what's your kind of mentality going into that? Like, are you are you attracted to those ones or are you attracted to something that comes from a, a barrel picking group or a store that that you know of rather than something that has you know Brett Elliott's name on the side of it? Yeah, I mean, I'll be just straight up honest with you. I don't ever buy um, bottles in stores anymore, sp uh, specifically Four Roses barrel picks. Um, it would have to be something that kind of fits into the run that I like. Like if it was like a sister barrel to my barrel or, you know, just the stats all kind of added up to me, the right recipe, maybe at the right uh, proof, uh, stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean, I get excited when I see stuff at the gift shop. If it's kind of a recipe I don't usually see there, or again, I, like I guess I'm all about the runs, you know. So um, that kind of dictates everything for me. Uh, and I have enough for roses and tried enough that I'm not really out there trying to take risks. I kind of just buy what I feel like I know that I'm gonna like. You know, it's a it's a educated guess. So, uh, but when I first started, I mean, it was all about you know, buying random bottles, random barrels and trying it. And, you know, you didn't win every time, but I mean, it's kind of just how it is with everything. You got to take a shot and learn. 
In, me, I just want to throw something in really quick, Kenny. I yeah, I said two, two things. First of all, Brent Elliott's a good guy, and I have had things that I that he's picked that I've liked. So I don't want to, I don't want anyone to think that I don't think he's <laughs> some great he's not, stuff. He's not listening to this, and he's like that mother. <laughs> no, he's, I've traded emails with him. He's a great guy, and I've I've had things that he's done that are awesome. I just used two examples. I didn't want to leave it with the wrong impression. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. I know he listens to this every once in a while too. So he'll uh, so go ahead and give your shout out to him now. And, you know, blow some kisses to him if you want. No, I like him a lot. <laughs> you know what? I'll take this. I'll take this time to say a little bit about Brent. Um, people don't give him enough credit. They they think he kind of came out of nowhere, but I mean, he's been with the company for probably ten years now. Uh, he worked with Jim Relich for years, and he's had a hand in uh, the small, the limited editions for a long time. So. Uh, I know it's been a bit of a rocky start. I mean, I guess we're past the start at this point, but uh, I just don't think people realize, you know, how long he's been involved and what he actually does. I mean, he literally is the quality control department still to this day. So um, I think, you know, although the little, you know, some people disagree with his his uh, palate or whatever. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, but um, he definitely deserves some credit on, on that end. Uh, people don't really realize, you know, he didn't just come out of nowhere, basically. He had oh, yeah. a great year. He had a great year, in my opinion, in seventeen. Oh, they just they dominated. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to see what the next one brings out, right? No, uh, and I agree. He's a great guy. He's he's invited uh, me and a few other bloggers to just kind of hang out in the lab one day, and we kind of had a great time just you know going through and tasting random stuff. And so he's definitely very uh, um, you know hospitable and uh, great guy to even talk to, right? So. But with that, let's let's kind of move on a little bit. So the the Travis, you had a good question about you know how you were able to start tasting and testing and kind of you know guiding your way through this. I mean, is there any other way that you can try to figure out which recipes you like the best without trying literally like buying a bottle of every single recipe? Like, is there is there a way that you can narrow down to something that you can say like, well, I've got I don't have. Uh, thousand dollars to blow on all 10 here so let's let's try to narrow it down here so what's what's the what's the ability to make that happen i mean I, oh uh facebook that's a good Instagram, question i mean you gotta, you gotta trade samples or buy samples i mean i started out on instagram before i was on facebook and trading samples and trying stuff yeah buying bottle splits you know get do them locally. You know, I, when I first got into this, I um, lived in the middle of nowhere. I didn't have guys around me to split bottles with. But I mean, if you live in a big city or you got a group of guys split the bottle, you know, and um, so there's a few different ways. And, and worst case, you can always blend it with more four roses and it's going to taste good. So <laughs> <laughs> keep blending until it hits the profile that you want. Blake's That's got it. something special going on there. <laughs> and so i guess it's uh you know when you when you bring up so that's that's another good thing that, that you bring up to travis because um you kind of started i don't know if you started this fad or maybe blake started like somebody did of trying to create your own limited edition small batches with the um the single barrels that are on the market so kind of talk about what that is and, and how it works yeah, that was definitely me. <laughs> uh, but there's, but there's, a little bit, there's a little bit of a difference. I just did one, really. It was the 2012 small batch. Uh, I loved it so much, and, you know, I didn't buy any in 2012. I wasn't really into it at that point. Um, and they're six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800 on, you know, Facebook. Um, so I, I figured out that, you know, all the four components in that, uh, I could buy, I could buy the 17 year old OBSV, which was expensive. Don't get me wrong. Um, 13 year OBSK on down the line. So I bought those four bottles. I found out the ratios from Brent. Uh, and then I just mixed them together. It's clearly different. It's four single barrels as opposed to a massive vat, but all those barrels that I bought were all, you know, the 17 year OBSV was 17 years old and bottled in 2012. So it, in my head, it all kind of matched up and made sense. So that one was fun. That's the only one I've really done. But uh, was it close? I'll give Blake. Blake gets a lot of credit because he made a ton of them. And uh, Brett, you were on that um, 
the blind tasting, like th- some of those were awesome, man. I mean, they were the best ones. So, yeah, the some the couple of them really were. Uh, my favorite one was a blend. Um, so yeah, he's taken. He hasn't matched the ages up to the limited editions, but he's matched the recipes and then blended those together at the right ratio. So it's a little different, but dude, that stuff's so good. And for anybody that doesn't know, the real magic secret here is his ninja blender or his magic bullet blender, whatever it is. That's <laughs> so make sure you go check out Blake's YouTube channel and you can kind of <laughs> see how he kind of fools a lot of people into the uh, drinking stuff by essentially putting it in a blender. But oh, um, Blakey. Yeah. yeah. But Brett, have you ever tried recreating a lot of these, these single barrel or sorry, these, these limited edition small batch uh, expressions exactly. using different kinds of single barrels? Not once. I, I'm not. I'm not going down that road. I, I know what's ahead of me if I start that. But it, it'll never end. I, I you, you can buy. I'd buy a hundred bottles, and and I'd be doing that all night. Like I couldn't even. I haven't even been interested in doing that. <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, other than the 2012, Travis, have you tried other ones that just kind of create your own? Um, small batch blend or, or are you kind of in a camp of, I, I don't really want to waste any more single barrels by trying to create blends and who knows what it's going to end up like. Um, a little bit of both actually. Uh, one that I always recommend to people to start off is the barrel strength small batch. So you take O's, the, the two O's and the two K's and mix those together. I think it's, I'd probably do like 60% k and 40 percent oh i can't remember exactly what it is but that's a good one so you get a barrel strength small batch like what you would buy at the store but barrel strength so i think that's a good one for people to try i've done that it's awesome um but as far as limited edition i just i've just done too much blending and that's i just i'll never drink all these blends i mean when people come over i'm like just please drink this like (laughs) Uh, so um, I've got another question. I gotta remind myself to ask it, but you you said something that is is always piqued my interest, and I've always wanted to ask it before. And this is a great episode to ask it: is why do you don't think that Four Roses has ever put out a small batch barrel proof, just something that is consistently on the shelves? Like you can get single barrels, you can get small batch proof down, but why not just a regular anywhere between seven to ten years small batch blend? That's barrel proof. Yeah, I think um, part of it is, you know, they don't have enough product to sell anyways. You know, their business is doing so well. um, They don't really need a new product. Um, And I think that uh, the upper management is kind of doesn't really want to get into doing new products like that. They flirted with doing um, uh, some 100 proof non-chill filtered they wanted to do like a special kind of release for that and they couldn't even really get that done so um i just think that they're fine where they are basically and that's they kind of just luckily just kind of leave it up to us we can do it ourselves brent anything to add on to that i think it'd be tough to keep that on the shelf i i I mean if you You look at it the way of like stag jr or something yeah, or Elijah Craig barrel proof. I I don't know that they want they, they they have enough trouble with the with the one or two limited editions they put out each year. I don't think they want to mess with another one. That's mm-hmm. a good point too. Yeah. So uh, there's Travis. You had mentioned something else that kind of kind of piqued my interest as well. So you had mentioned you know when you created this, you had to go and source like a 17 year. We've seen some things that have been hidden from the gift shop that are, you know, there's rumors up to 23 year single barrels coming out. And we know that there's not a whole lot of stuff that is going to be that high in age for much longer. But one thing that we have noticed is that when you are looking at single barrel picks that come out regularly, is that the ages have continually be has been been decreasing, you know, exponentially in the past, say, two years, right? I mean, maybe three years. It's been going from 12 years to 10 years. And now we're at like eight and a half is almost like norm, right? Um, do you think that they can still keep this this pace up or do they need to just kind of put a, a, a bigger halt on the barrel program to let those age a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what their inventory situation is like. I mean, I think that they've probably got, 
a quarter million barrels would be my guess at least. So I think that they're probably fine overall. They only do 600 barrels a year for the program. So it's not a ton. Um, so, I, you know, I, I've never really figured out exactly why the ages quote unquote dropped. Um, I think that it's another one of those things that's cyclical. You see them now they're nine, 10, 11 years old. Um, and really the, the range that, they're supposed to allow is eight to 12. It's not supposed to be below that or above that anyway. So all this, the some 13 year old stuff that came out, usually when it gets to above like 11 or 12, they put it away for a limited edition. So um, I think that another part of it is that in, you know, 2015 or whatever, when they did kind of reset and have these lower ages, people actually started paying attention. So that's like the first thing they noticed and kind of like, Oh, you know, why are all these barrels so young when actually they're not? I mean, eight, nine, ten years old is really when most of the Four Roses is kind of prime, as Brett Brett alluded to that earlier. So I think people just get caught up. It's just the thing nowadays, the label, the age, the proof, all this stuff, when in, in fact these barrels are really good. <laughs> I agree. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes an 11 or 12-year-old is, is, is terrific, and sometimes it's not. And I've had I've had eight and nine year olds that are just perfect. So I, I don't think you can criticize them for that. And plus we don't, we don't know what they're holding back and for what, you know, just because they're rolling out eight and nine year old barrels for the barrel pick program, you don't know what they're, what they're saving. And that's, what's going to be really fun to see. Yeah, yeah. They're saving a lot of old stuff for limited editions and fun things. So, I mean, it's not like it's not there, you know, I mean that Brent, the, the, um, 14 year OESK, that was a lot of bottles and a lot of barrels and all these limited edition small batches and the 16 year OBSK in the gift shop. That was only a handful of barrels. But I mean, they're putting out stuff, Al Young's. Like, where'd that 23 year old OBSV come from? I mean, they've, they've got stuff. <laughs> Have you ever had, by the way, that I don't know if you've noticed, you, I mean, Travis noticed this, I'm sure, but a lot of people watching or listening probably don't know that Al Young, if you match that up with the 2014, they're, other than the ages, they're, they're, they're really all close to identical. It's kind of fun to watch. I mean, the Al Young is just an older version of the 14. If you really want to try them side by side and see the interplay, it's kind of fun. I never really noticed that, honestly. And the, the 2014 is really underappreciated. Um, that bottle just gets better as it goes along. Um, but I haven't really had a 14 in a long time and didn't know that. That's very interesting. Yeah, there was also, um, for anybody that is unaware, trying to catch up with episodes, there you can go and check one back out that we did with Brett Elliott uh, talking about the Al Young release where we had actually gone and sampled through all the individual bourbons that then went into the blend. Um, so if you want to, go back and you can listen to that episode. It was, it was a good one as well. Now, Brett, you had also mentioned, uh, you, you used the word perfect. Um, and we talked about this at the very beginning of the episode of, is there has there ever been some sort of bottle that you just lose your mind over that you've just got to find more of it? And, you know, I'll, I'll kind of ask you again while we're here on air. Has there ever been a, a four roses pick where you're like, you lose your mind? You got to say, like, I've got to have at least three or four or five bottles of this to, to last it for the next, you know, decade. Right. I mean, is, have you ever found yourself say that to a, a particular four roses pick, like not, not going to say small batch limited releases or anything like that, but just a standard four roses pick. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I've got a few of those. So it, it's, some yeah, point, I was like, is it biased because you picked them? Um, a couple. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, Go I, figure. I, 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 what, here's what I've come to realize is the first one I had, um, was amazing. That was the Q, that OBS Q. That was incredible. But then I had an OBS V that was amazing. And so when you've had a few of them, and, and we were talking on air, off air earlier, this, there's a pick that, that was done that, you know, five people said, you need to try this, you need to try this. I said, okay, fine. You know, and I saw the prices of this thing. And I'm like, I'm not paying that for a four roads, a single barrel. There's so many good ones out there. So someone sent me a sample and I drank it here when we were getting ready to start the show. And I was like, yeah, it's good. But so that's that's kind of where I fall. I think, I mean, even the best ones are, like I said before, it's perfect. What's perfect to me is that's a great bourbon. But is it something I'm going to go nuts over? No, because I know that there's so many picks being done that there's great picks coming, and and I'm and I know I'll get bottles of those. So I'm not going to go crazy chasing any of these down because it has a reputation 
Uh, and that's the first thing I get scared of when, when, when something gets hype around it. And then I, then I really, unless I'm on the other side of that, of course, but I, I just, I usually just, yeah, I get excited about it. That's cool. If I get one, great. Um, what's, what's more fun is if someone comes in town and has it with them and pours it for me, that's usually when I enjoy it the most is when I'm with somebody else anyway. Um, but there's just so many good ones out there. So t- the long answer to your short question is, um, there are some that I remember more than others, but nothing that I would lose an arm and leg over. What about you, Travis? Uh, somebody that's, you know, let's not, let's not put like the ones that you've picked into the equation here. Everybody's got this thing that says like, Oh, it's my baby. You're like, I want to have plenty of these, right? You know, you've, you've named mm-hmm. for anybody that doesn't know, uh, why do you name it the captain's pick? Can you see him over here? So, so anybody that doesn't, it's his dog. So, so he's got, he's got this, this relationship. So, you know, other than saying, you know, the captain's pick or your babies, like, are there any of those like four roses, single power picks out there that you've said, you know, like, this is amazing. I've never had anything like this. Um, I don't know about, I've never had anything like this, but pretty much on like a monthly basis, I find a barrel. I'm like, this is amazing. I need at least three of them. So um, (laughs) the kind of the, the point there though, is that it, always happens so i don't know if i'm just kind of just that obsessed with it but i mean if you really like it something this is a big lesson for everybody not just with four roses but there's always another bottle like you don't need to freak out about something because there's always going to be something else so yeah i've loaded up on barrels before you know especially back in 2014 when there was some just incredible obsk obsv uh, like every recipe was just amazing back then some great runs like yeah i mean i've got multiples of a lot of different barrels because they really are just that good and i mean you know still haven't even found some recipes that were that good to this day so yeah the answer is absolutely yes (laughs) And, 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 and until Travis just walks away from the game, some of those he's never going to get to because he's always getting new ones that are exciting. And that's the problem with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I'll hold on to a bottle of whatever barrel for, you know, two years. And then all of a sudden I, I'm picking a barrel and I'm buying, you know, four or five bottles. I'm like, well, I can't just keep adding. Like, so I'll sell a, a bottle or two or three that I've held on for two years. And I'm like, you know, on with on to the next one. <laughs> Oh yeah, believe me. I think a lot of us have uh, could be in your your seat as well. I think uh, you know, especially being here in Kentucky as well. Um, there's there's at least a single barrel four roses somewhere in the city of Louisville at any time. So it's not like it's slim pickings, but I think that's the good thing about the program is that it is it is accessible. Um, you do have access to it, you know, anywhere, and it's at a it's at a pretty good price no matter what. It's nothing that's going to be um, asinine. Can I ask a question, Kenny? This is my show, Brett. What, I'm the one. No, I'm I just kidding. Go ahead. Start, oh. I, no, I, the, here's a, this, it's a question I've had that I never asked, but uh, Travis may have the answer. The, so I've read about all these great runs, right? So people look at the, on the bottle, people probably know it's a, it'll say like ME, for example, we talked about earlier, it's, you know, the M warehouse and the East side and, and the rack and the, 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 my, so I'm in packaging. So, you know, we sell bottles and things like that. And, you know, the manufacturers will put a laser code or a pallet tag to identify where, you know, what a particular production run went. So if there's a quality issue, you can go back and trace it. And I've always wondered, you know, the bourbon geeks out there are like, I've had people even message me, oh my God, do you have any, do you have any Fs from this run and this rack and this tier? And, you know, my, I guess my question is, do you think that those, those tags are on the bottle for the bourbon geeks or are they, for, is it for the distillery in case there's something wrong or something is off that they can go back and trace it to that particular spot in the warehouse? I'll, I'll give my answer first and I'll let Travis go. I think it's a sign of inefficiency because you want to, you want to make something that's handcrafted and labeled and stands out from a packaging standpoint when you're looking at it on the shelf, right? I mean, you see it, you see it, you know, in cursive, you see the name, you see whatever it is. And I think from a, a consumer standpoint is that's what maybe attracts you. I, I think the, what, what you were saying, you're just adverse effects of it, but I'll let Travis give his opinion too. Um, they do have laser codes on the bottles. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, look at every other distillery that does single barrels, they don't necessarily mark the barrel. Well, I mean, I guess a lot of them do, but that detailed of, of information, I think just four roses attempt at being very transparent, which they're probably the most transparent 
of the big distilleries. So uh, I really think it's just making it personal to the picked it or the group or store or whatever. They just want all the information on there. Um, I don't think that necessarily, I mean, it does help if you want to email Mandy and be like, Hey, I got this, you know, here's the barrel information. She can tell you everything about it, but, um, don't email Mandy. She's going to be mad that I everybody emails. <laughs> but no, just don't say her email out here. It'll be, it'll be fine. <laughs> right. Um, but no, they do laser code them. So, I mean, I, I don't think that it's about like, you know, if there's an issue, they have to use the labels to, to track it down. I don't know. Brett, you have any other follow up questions for that? No. Okay. no? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. If you want to, if you want to host some time, just let me know, buddy. We'll make it happen. <laughs> I'm just making myself at home. Yeah, he needs, he needs <laughs> for my up. for my last <laughs> guest appearance that I'm asked to be here. <laughs> no, it's quite all right. That's awesome. So, um, got got kind of two more questions to kind of wrap this up. Uh, one we kind of touched on a little bit when we had talked about the Al Young 50th and looking at each one of the barrels that went into the blend. Um, and, you know, there's been some things that have come out in the gift shop in the past uh, few months that have been extremely high in the, the age range of, you know, between 17 and 23 years and stuff like that. You know, I'll kind of get your all's opinion. When it comes to Four Roses, does the and, and from a single barrel standpoint, because I know you guys have had some of these in, that are in the higher ranges. Do you really think that time in the oak? actually makes it better or do you think it's more or less people they really want it because it's got a high age statement on it so i I think a lot of the hype about it is the higher age statement it's just like any other stick sticker or label or whatever it's just something for people to get excited about um for me personally i just prefer that oakier flavor i mean i'll drink any four roses i do love the 2013 a uh, single barrel is 13 year OBSK. I've drank through, I can't even count how many. I just love that, that kind of oaky flavor. I think it, I mean, they wouldn't release it if it wasn't, you know, age right and wasn't good products. So they are all really good. There's that. Um, but for me, like I don't get too caught up, you know, I'll drink an eight year old or seven year old four roses, you know, right next to a 17 year old. I think they're all just really good. Um, and I'm able to buy them, you know, at cost now, which helps a lot. But, uh, I think a majority of people that don't really drink four roses and kind of get caught up in that, it's definitely just a number that they're after. I think most of those people aren't opening the bottle that I, it, it's, it's rare to see like the one that came, what, the one that came out in the gift shop, the 16 year, um, yeah. most of okay. the people that bought that, it's, oh my God, there's a 16 year single barrel. I guess it's not common. But I think, like anything else, it's taste. Do you like it or not? You know, Travis likes the older ones. I tend to like the older ones, but I also like some of the younger ones. I think it's different for each. And the lesson, the lesson is you got to taste it and don't and don't marry yourself to it's got to be this old or it's got to be this recipe. I think you have to try it and and decide which. You know, they all stand on their own. Yeah. So two quick points to that. We had. Uh... Lauren uh, Simpson's big uh, charity blind tasting and in in my group there was probably 20 of us or something number like that and uh, the 16 year OBSK and 17 year old OBSV were in there blind and I don't think either of them finished in the top three Uh, so that was a little surprising and then the 16 year OBSK I'm I'm obsessed with that I absolutely love it but I take it around to tastings a lot of times and a lot of guys just don't like it. It's too minty. They just don't like it. So, you know, that's good for me. Keep them away. But um, it's just your, your, your palate. What do you prefer? I, I like them a little older, but also, like I said, I have some two year old OBSV in here. That's just absolutely awesome. So, you know, it just depends on the barrel. I'd love to try that. I think the one thing to remember here is, and we go back to it all the time. It, 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 there is no, there, there's no best bourbon that can actually be crowned by anybody. I think it's what do you like to drink and what do you enjoy? And like Travis just said, I mean, that that may be one of his favorite bourbons on earth. And just because other people don't like it, you know, there are people who love it. And and thankfully they offer enough variation in those ten recipes. They they have something for everybody. You can find it. 
And so the the last question I'll, I'll kind of throw, this was coming from Michael Urato. He said um, he wants to hear your opinions regarding the rumor mutated V yeast that was said to be used in the 2012-2013 Oh, I'm so glad he asked that, Travis. You were there with me when, when Jim told that story. Yeah. Yeah, so this is – I'm still trying to process all of this because there's two – different runs of 17 year old OBSV. I mean, there was some that came out in 2010 and then of course it came out in 2012 and 2013. So I wouldn't guess that the 2010 stuff was mutated. I really don't know, but um, it's hard to pin Jim down on that. But yeah, I mean, for sure that the, the 17 year old OBSV in the uh, 2012 and 2013, I mean, yeah, that yeast mutated and unfortunately they didn't save a sample of it so they can't recreate it. And that, and that, but that single barrel was used in some of the best limited editions after that, right? Isn't that the whole, that was yep. an amazing story. They just didn't save it. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, they almost didn't even distill it and age it. I guess it was probably Jim that was like, oh, let's see what it has. What a most, great call. Most of, most of the good things at, at Four Roses are because of Jim and, and certain people. But I mean, he, and, and well, he kind of succeeded despite the upper management i guess that's kind of as pc as i can put it <laughs> <laughs> so, so you think the mutated yeast is kind of what made the made those runs i I'm, now i'm saying it right made those runs special yeah i mean i'm sure it was just uh probably one it was probably two um mash two mashes you know distilled to create probably 250 barrels i mean that was it that's a run is you know 230 barrels so i think it was just one one run it was probably the end of the season or something like that and so there wasn't a ton of it but yeah i mean it stretches you know through the gift shop there was 12 barrels or something like that and then in the 2012 and 2013 limited edition so what was the single barrel that had that there was a single barrel right that it was a limited anniversary bottle that had just that just well, that that's, the, that's what I'm saying, though. That was in 2010. So there was two different runs of 17-year-old OBSV, and I don't think that those were that original run was mutated yeast. This is where I don't know. As much as I talk about this, um, I still don't know the answer to that, but I'm, I'm fairly certain it's the stuff that ended up in the 2012 and 2013. That was the mutated yeast. But there was another one before that, so it kind of – and that stuff's really good, so it kind of – takes away from the mutated yeast to, to me a little bit like you know that was good but i don't think it was like something totally crazy special mm -hmm. i don't know if that makes sense i think you you've probably hit some some key heartstrings of those really bourbon nerds out there and then some people were like i thought we were just talking about 10 recipes you're telling me there's 11 now or <laughs> something right so <laughs> Yeah, I mean, was, it's the same yeah. B yeast, but it just kind of mutated and it was like way more comp. So that was a one time thing. Probably actually, <laughs> technically should have just been dumped and not even aged. I mean, the way that things work, but luckily they decided to keep it. it shit was cheap back then, so who cared? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and that's why All right. college is the man. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. He, he, made, he made a few good calls, I think, in his day. So you got to give him the accolades for that. Uh, so last thing, you know, as you know, Brett had talked about earlier, has the has the Emmy Emmy Warehouse fad has that passed? When there was everybody was wanting that, is there is there a new fad that everybody wants right now? Well, the the Emmy thing is is done, but the the spirit is alive. I mean, that's the way I buy picks. If I'm not picking the barrel, that's the way I buy them. They definitely have these distillation runs. Uh, a, a chunk of the barrels will all age right next to each other in the same warehouse, same rack, same tier, all that stuff. Uh, so you'll see them. There was the TS OESVs, the PS, the um, OESQ that aged in the MW warehouse. I mean, there's just been a bunch of them over the years. At the same time that that OBSV ME run was going on, there was OBSKQS and OESOBN. I mean, it's just it's not ME, it's just that's a good way to find barrels that are similar. So like if you find one that you like, you know, you can look on the spreadsheet I made or email Four Roses and, you know, find something that aged very close, was distilled on the same day, same age, you know, age right in the same spot. Of course, they're all single barrels, so it's not going to be exactly the same, but I feel like that's the best 
most educated guess you can make is going by the run. Brett, have you seen any fad, any fads or trends? And then we'll we'll kind of end it on that. I I try not to buy too much into those. I I know that people that people stick to them, but uh, I I just feel like I, sometimes they can be you know same tier, just a little bit over and be very different to me. So you know I I'll generally buying a pick for me. I'll generally go off of somebody I trust, and most of the time it'll be something I like. Sometimes it won't be, but um, that's a lot of work to do that. But yeah, I think if if you're you find something you really really like and you can't get another bottle of it, I guess try and find the closest thing. Well, I appreciate all your answers, but you're you're all wrong. It's actually based on stickers now. So <laughs> all stickers. I'm so over stickers. I'm done with them. <laughs> we'll save that for a different day. But fellas, I want to say thanks again for coming on the show tonight and talking about you know your recipe or your you know talking about Four Roses recipes and your thoughts and sort of some of the mentality that that goes into it as well. So before we sign off, I want to give you all an opportunity just to say again uh, who you are and if people want to get in contact with you, if they want to know about some random spreadsheet that exists, like Travis, like how do you find that? So Travis, I'll let you go first. Um, I honestly don't even know besides Facebook. Um, in the groups, I have a, a Four Roses group, Taste the Four Roses. There's about 2000 or more people in there that's a good way to start but i'm really only on facebook i don't use twitter or, or much else um but travis hill you can find me hopefully we have um mutual friends on facebook but that's where i'm at so feel free to reach out happy to talk uh yeah just, i'm on twitter and instagram at brett atlas i uh, bourbon banter uh dot com bourbon banter good blog good group um and i'm on facebook too i spend way too much time talking to some of you out there but it's fun i met some really fun people that way it, it seems that's the the we all just kind of get sucked in the spiral of facebook nowadays that's a i have to make a i have to put a 2018 goal list together it says focus more on work less less time on facebook forums you know fellas i want to say Thank you again for coming on tonight. It was a it was a pleasure talking to you, especially about this. Make sure that everybody that's out there listening, you do follow these guys. Try to learn more about it. Go out there and and buy a few different recipes. Try them side by side. Do some bottle splits. Find people to swap samples with. Whatever it is, and you too can one day come on the show and give your recipes and thoughts as well. But with that, uh, make sure you're following us uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Burn Pursuit. If you do like the show, make sure you support us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit, because as you had heard, we heard some questions from our audience that was listening to us live, and that is one of the perks of being a Patreon member. So if you want to watch these uh, and as they're happening live and be a part of the show, make sure you go and you support us there as well. With that, if you have any show suggestions, you want to send us an email, please do so. It's the duo, T H E D U O, at bourbonpursuit.com. Fellas, thanks again, and we will see everybody next week. If you love Eagle Rare Bourbon, then go support the causes they stand for at eaglerarelife.com. You can read hundreds of stories, just like the ones you heard today. So go and vote for the 2019 nominees that inspire you the most. Hurry, because voting ends on December 5th.